Thank you, Maureen, and, and thank you everyone for joining in today. I certainly am looking forward to sharing some of these insights that I've been fortunate enough to develop over the past few years. Uh, I want to cover with you, as the title of, on the presentation uh, states, uh, the, the pitfalls in commercial management. And for those of you who you know, might say, well, it's commercial management, that's not really related to me. Uh, frankly, it is, and in fact, regardless if you're on the buy side or the sell side, the content that I'm gonna share with you is gonna be very relevant. Uh, within the discipline of commercial management, we're seeing some evolution where people within the practice of commercial management come from buy side and or sell side. Uh, some have gone into sales roles and then they've come into the procurement side. Some have started their careers in procurement and have moved into the sales side. So regardless of which perspective you are, and obviously within a government public sector environment, you're really only gonna be doing the buy side. Uh, the US federal government doesn't do a lot of sales other than perhaps posted stamps, and even at that, it's going through the US Postal Service. But there really isn't a lot of sales, but the commercial management practices are gonna be hopefully very relevant to you, even though you're looking at it from just one side of the relationship. Uh, the pitfalls, as you can see in the title, uh, assume that uh, there are some pitfalls because uh, we are gonna cover today how to avoid those. Some of the pitfalls that we're gonna basically be addressing are areas such as how teams are disconnected. Uh, many are still operating in silos. Uh, many out there are still operating on a more tactical basis absent of any strategy or overall guidance or plan, uh, recognizing that uh, they themselves at times are doing this and doing it at their own volition or at their own direction. Hopefully that doesn't occur too often, but it still nevertheless is a pitfall in commercial management. Many we see are focused still on risk allocation rather than risk mitigation or prevention. And we'll cover that here in the slides. We see many are still out there not collaborating, not finding areas to innovate around. We're seeing that there's great inflexibility in many instances, a lack of agility and velocity in how people operate in their commercial contracting environments and relationships. We're still seeing poor communications, poor change management. And so the list of pitfalls of challenges of barriers are out there and they continue today, uh, much like they have in the past five to 10 years and even longer. But we wanted to start addressing how to avoid those pitfalls because those pitfalls in aggregate, in most organizations, regardless if it's public sector or private sector, represent on average across the globe around 9.15% of value leakage meaning if you have $100 million of value opportunity, you're losing 9.15 million of that value because these pitfalls are being stepped into, if you will. And so if we can recognize the pitfalls, how to avoid those pitfalls, we can keep that 9.15% value loss, hopefully to a minimum. It's unfortunate to see uh, the instances of value loss when many of these pitfalls can be avoided. So without any further ado, let's get into what some of these pitfalls are and how to avoid them. Uh, this goes towards that communication, lack of communication, lack of collaboration, uh, and that is the advent and proliferation across many organizations, public sector and private sector, of supply chain councils. A supply chain council is a group of individuals from both the buyer, the customer organization, as well as the supplier, uh, vendor, contractor organization. Sometimes these councils cut across multiple suppliers and contractors, and sometimes it's with just one. And so a supply chain council creates for itself a mission to set a direction and an overall strategy for the players within that council, within that supply chain, to more effectively work together. Unfortunately, what we see is the customer works on their agenda, 
the contractor, the supplier works on their agenda, the subcontractors work on their agendas, and hence there is no overall oh, coordination, collaboration. Many when asked, why is that the case? They say, well, that's not my role. That's you know somebody else's role. But that somebody else never really gets identified within that population. And so having a supply chain council created where that council creates for itself a mission, vision, value statements, and so forth, uh, enables at least some increase in the somewhat common set of objectives, of purpose, of alignment, of uh, harmony within those various players within that supply chain. Participants in that council tend to be people at the higher level of the respective organizations, people from senior executives and business unit leaders, uh, other key stakeholders, and they can work together as a senior level team to help build greater oh, value capture, but also knocking down the barriers and enable some of the uh, otherwise impossible or uh, illogical, uh, improbable type of uh, challenges uh, that would otherwise you know, continue to exist. So we want to make sure that a supply chain council uh, is at least given some thought uh, by the players within a supply chain. And in some instances, due to budget reasons, due to uh, the short duration of a project or of an opportunity uh, or myriad of other reasons, the parties may decide, you know what, uh, supply chain council isn't really appropriate here, but at least if you take a segmentation approach in your commodities and your categories using categories uh, planning, category management, strategic sourcing, you identify typically it, it falls in the upper right quadrant. Many understand what that means. The upper right quadrant of your commercial opportunities. And so I would encourage you to help avoid some of the silos, some of the poor communications, poor change management, to entertain the idea of a supply chain council. Other way to avoid some of the pitfalls is through technology. Uh, we, as a profession, have started to embrace technology. Uh, unfortunately, we're not totally there, but at least we have made some progress. We're seeing over the commercial officers group over the past oh, five to 10 years, that there is increasingly more and more technology that's being integrated in to organizations. Uh, electronic contracting tools are out there. Uh, there's numerous ones out there. The challenge is, what is your electronic contracting strategy? Uh, we see, unfortunately, many out there collecting all the tools but not really having an overriding strategy around that. By analogy, if we were to build a house, we had a vacant lot and we wanted to build a house, would it be prudent for us to go down to the local hardware store and buy hammers and saws, lumber and glass and concrete, and after we've got all the tools and raw materials put together and dropped on the vacant lot, scratch our head and say, gee, now what type of house do we want to build? Obviously, we wouldn't do that. We would want to create a blueprint, design the house, put it on paper, make sure that it works for all the family members, make sure that all of our stakeholders are satisfied, making sure that it complies with all the local regulations of building codes, et cetera. And then once that has passed us in the process, we would then go out and buy the lumber, the saws, the hammers, the nails, and so forth. But not us, no. <laughs> We go out and we buy software, we buy electronic contracting tools and various other items. We bring it all together and then scratch our head and ask why is there this interoperability challenge? Why is there a challenge with integration of these tools? These tools just aren't working like the people who sold them to us have promised that they'll operate. And so we have to find ways to define a strategy and then step two is go out and get the technology that aligns and enables that strategy. Unfortunately, many times people go out and get that technology and force fit their strategy 
to accommodate the technology that they went out and somewhat spontaneously went out and bought or licensed. We have to make sure that with all the tools out there, we understand we, what each and every one of those tools is capable of doing, where our needs are, you know, do we have a P2P or a purchase to pay uh, system in place, but we don't have adequate tools, or do we already have those tools? And if so, then why would we want to go out and buy more of that technology? Uh, logistics design software, manugistics, that type of uh, software is out there and it's well established, it's a great offering, and yet many times we find that it's not going to serve our immediate purposes. We want to make sure that our ERP system, the software, be it SAP or um, Oracle or whatever ERP system we would have, is well understood to make sure that whatever bolt-ons we buy or license, it will work with that underlying backbone of an ERP system. There are so many developments in the world of big data, optical character recognition, RFID, robotics, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and, and it's only just starting. Five years from now, the, the materials, the tools, the technology that we're gonna have in front of us is going to you know, make our heads spin to some extent, saying, wow, remember back in 2019 when <laughs> we didn't even have this? There's gonna be instances where you depending upon what budget you might have for the technology, where you're going to be speaking into your smartphone and saying to your uh, device, well, tell me, how many of my contracts are up for renewal within the next 30 days? Or how many instances have we accepted this term from this given supplier and it has you know, come back to haunt us? Uh, what is the payment terms uh, on our contracts with the supplier over the past five years, much like you speak with Siri or Alexa or whatever other automated assistant you might be familiar with, and within a split second, the answer comes back and says, uh, yes, you have coming up you know, 25 contracts that are due for renewal. Uh, four of them are automatically going to renew unless you do this step or that step by next Tuesday. The automated systems that are out there right now in the private sector are allowing private sector players to do that. You know, some large technology companies such as an IBM, uh, Hewlett Packard and others are out there actually capturing. Now obviously they're uh, with an additional purpose of selling software and they have Watson and they want to make sure Watson get, has a big ROI to their profits through the bottom line but many in the private sector are creating technologies that are enabling commercial advantage over their commercial partners. And so if you're walking into a conversation with a IBM or a Hewlett Packard, or even you know, some other non-tech supplier, you have to ask yourself, are they enabled by the technology uh, through a strategy that allows them greater insights, greater ideas and understanding around what we need to do next. And so having that technology in place is important, but you know, being able to align it to a strategy for greatest maximum effect is really of utmost importance. Segmentation. We talk about it, many of us do it, but perhaps many of us haven't done it to the extent to which we should, or we're misusing it. Segmentation needs to be, oh, what I'll call smart. Uh, the segmentation has to lead to us having a, a portfolio of approaches that we take in how we manage our supplier relationships and how we go out and source within our categories. We have to assure ourselves that just because it worked on this instance, on this commodity or category that it might work on the next, but there's no guarantees that it'll work on the next category or commodity. So we have to find out the instances where on some segments we do collaborate and in some instances we don't collaborate. 
when we do find opportunities to collaborate, then we need to find those mutual objectives. We need to find performance metrics of the relationship, such as avoidance of disputes, speed and velocity of getting things done together. Many times people feel that collaboration is a way in which we'll just tell the supplier how they have to operate, how they have to perform. And the performance metrics are basically unilateral, where we, the customer, tell them, the contractor or supplier, what needs to be done. Frankly, as we're seeing over the globe, more and more collaborative approaches, more and more that are in that segment around collaboration with strategic partner type commercial partners, that it is a relationship that is monitored and measured rather than one of the parties in that relationship. Now, this isn't to say that this happens everywhere and in all types of categories, commodities, goods and services. There are plenty of arm's length transactions that require arm's length tactics, but we have to make sure that we understand which segment we're operating in and what are the appropriate tools and approaches within that segment and where are hybrid approaches going to be utilized and most effective. Category management is increasingly proving itself to be the way in which organizations in commercial buy side transactions are operating. And you within the US federal government, you're very much uh, along this path. It is the way for you already. Uh, many of you are personally involved in category strategies. Uh, many of you have moved into other areas such as demand management, total cost of ownership, which hopefully all of you have had some working familiarity around risk mitigation rather than risk allocation, uh, strategic sourcing, supplier relationship management. These disciplines, these areas within our own toolbox or our approach box needs to be further understood and further developed of when do we want to strategically source? Which supplier relationships do we want to proactively manage and which supplier our relationships do we want to be merely reactive? The risk mitigation point on this slide is one I really want to emphasize. It is one that takes somewhat of a culture change. It, it really forces us to you know break with our traditions and really look at things a little different. It would involve us having to meet with our attorneys and talk about how our contract language is really more of a risk allocation rather than a risk mitigation. And what we are seeing in certain pockets of the globe, Australia is leading, the Australian government is doing this quite a bit. Uh, our friends up in Ottawa, up in Canada are moving in this direction. We're seeing it in Singapore. We're seeing it in Indonesia, Malaysia. Um, I'm going to be with the Kuwait government next week. And they are in fact moving in this direction so we're seeing this in, across the globe. Uh, and when we talk about risk mitigation, what are we doing in order to prevent that risk from ever materializing? And as you read your contract language, the boilerplate language, many times you'll find that the language is based on the assumption that a problem will arise. And when that problem does arise, then the other party is going to bear the cost and the burden of that adverse instance. Wouldn't it be great if we could somehow work together to prevent that problem from ever arising or work together to keep the impact, the consequences of that adverse event from creating major damage? Because if you could create zero percentage chance of something happening or zero amount of monetary damage. If you take probability times impact as the two coefficients, the two factors that lead to risk, 
wouldn't it be great to get one of those two to zero because anything times zero is zero. And so can we create scenarios through our commercial relationships where risk is driven towards zero? And by doing that, it doesn't really matter what the contract language says because that occurrence is going to be a non-event. It doesn't matter if the supplier takes on all the cost and the burden of an event which won't happen. But unfortunately, that's not the approach many of us are taking. Many of us are taking the approach that, hey, there's going to be problems, inevitably problems, somewhere within the relationship, within the project, and as long as I'm not the one or my employer is not the one who's going to have to bear that burden, then we're doing well. Well, frankly, our suppliers, our contractors see that risk. They take it on into the overall pricing to which they bid. And we many times don't recognize what the magnitude of that cost is. Because if we go out for three bids and we tell each of those three suppliers that they're going to have to take on that, oh, $100,000 of risk, all of them will be bidding a project at, say, $1.1 million dollars. If we were to assure them that that risk won't happen and that they have to bear the cost of it, but the cost is going to be zero, all three of those suppliers, contractors, and their bid would be bringing their cost, their price, down to a million dollars instead of the 1.1 million that otherwise is occurring when there is that risk allocation mentality rather than risk mitigation mentality built into our processes into our contract documents, into the approaches in which we manage those relationships. We see the enterprise, in quotes, with a capital E, as emerging in many organizations. And this is happening in the public sector. It's not just private sector. It's happening in both. And what we mean by enterprise, with a capital E, is a defined term. It's where multiple parties are working together for a common purpose. They are the adjacent links in that supply chain. They might be working together and having joint risk registers where they identify on a common shared spreadsheet, here's the risk that this project, that our enterprise, these are the risks that we're facing together. How are we working together to mitigate those risks? We look at the line items in the risk register and make sure that one of us or both of us are working to make sure that that risk is avoided or mitigated. Many instances in the non-enterprise arrangements, I have my risk register, you have your risk register. And I'm going to make sure that stuff stays off of my risk register and I'm going to push it onto your risk register and vice versa. Frankly, is that really leading to additional value capture? And the answer typically is no, it's not. We want to have shared databases, shared scorecards, shared risk registers. This means that we need portals that we somewhat have uh, oh, common access to, that it becomes problematic in many uh, public sector arrangements because of the oh, cybersecurity issues that are out there. And so we have a technology barrier that we have to figure how to overcome. But those barriers have been figured out by the Australians, the Canadians, and various others. And so I encourage you to not just look at the opportunity and say, well, we can't do that because of cybersecurity risks, etc. Others have figured it out. Others in the private sector have, as well as the public sector. There are increasingly oh, the, public, the private sector, oh, communal sharing of resources. For instance, you know, John Deere is a great example. A few years ago, they set up with some of their key suppliers uh, around the U.S. of when a truck comes with parts to the John Deere factory, we're going to use that same truck to put a tractor on to send back in the other direction back to that community. Other organizations without that type of collaboration would have a supplier bringing in their spare parts and then driving the truck back to their facility empty 
and John Deere would be sending a truck out with a tractor on it to that same community and bringing the truck back empty back to their headquarters or to their factory. So what can we do to work together and figure out how we can collaborate as customer and supplier, sharing resources, sharing our assets, and the assets can be physical or electronic, to work together as an enterprise. A great example is in uh, the patrol boat uh, enterprise out of Australia. This is a project I've been working on. These folks are based out of Darwin, which is on the northern edge of Australia. Uh, they have patrol boats that cruise around the northern boundary of Australia. Uh, I don't know if they in anticipate too many invasions from Papua New Guinea or from Indonesia, but nevertheless, they do have that uh, patrol boat uh, equipment need out there. Most of it is against drug smuggling rather than military invasion, but they want to make sure that those patrol boats are functional because every day a patrol boat is in dry dock getting maintenance. It means it's not out at sea protecting the coast of Australia. And so the contractor, the previous contractor uh, named Serco, uh, would be out in the middle of oh, 120 degree temperatures with the heat index added in, relatively humid, oh, 90 plus percent humidity environment in basically uh, as, asbestos type fire resistant clothing, uh, full suits uh, of clothing from foot to head, uh, basically passing out uh, while they're trying to do maintenance on the vessels. And the Australian Navy is looking at these people saying, hey, what's wrong with your employees? Why are they not productive? Why is it taking so long to get maintenance on our ships done so those ships can go back out to sea? And that you know, very contentious approach you know, ended up coming back to haunt. The publicity that started to get generated around uh, ships on the northern coast of Australia became somewhat commonplace within the press articles out there. So the Australian Navy decided we're going to embrace what they call, what we call, relational contracting. It's very much of a collaborative approach. And what I have on the slide here is the charter from that team. Uh, they look at various things such as team objectives, performance ma management and measures, uh, problem solving, uh, creating a no-blame culture, figuring out how to work together a joint working environment, how to build communications and continuous improvement, how to create gain and pain sharing, as well as risk uh, management and risk mitigation. So that is the focus in their contract, rather than indemnities and warranties that are going to be punitive and somewhat uh, oh, risk uh, allocative, these approaches are the approaches that they will take to make sure that the ships are out to sea. This is the third project I've worked on with the Australians. We had another project, a different type of ship, ANZAC category of ship out in Western Australia. FFG was another type of ship uh, in Garden Island and uh, Sydney Harbor. And in each of those other two instances, the successes were significant. Uh, they were tracking, the Australian Navy was tracking performance measures of their contractors for 30 years, five or six metrics every year they were measuring. And typically the majority or at least one or two were always the red downward pointed arrows. Once they took on a relational collaborative contracting approach and they continued with the same measures and metrics, it was all green upward pointing arrows on all of the metrics. It was the first time in 30 years in Western Australia that anything like that had happened with their contractor. And the success was repeated with the FFG ships in Garden Island and Sydney Harbor. And so when the patrol boat group said, what can we do to improve? They took the same approach and they have found the same level of success. So this has occurred at least three times in Australia, in the public sector in the past few years taking relational contracting. It has proven itself to be uh, reliable and repeatable, and they continue to expand how they're using relational contracting. Uh, 
a Talus is a contractor in Australia who's been involved with this. And Talus is now doing some patrol boat uh, maintenance in Canada. And so they suggested to their friends in Ottawa at the government, why don't we take on relational contracting? So we got involved with that effort and that relational approach is moving forward in Canada and the short term results have come back very positive. That's still a project that is relatively nascent. Uh, it's only been in place for a few months now, but it is already reaping some benefits. So, so Jim, I have a couple of contracting, questions relational for you. Contracting. Sure. The first yeah. one, are you putting all of these titles into the contract um, before it is um, uh, advertised. So you're saying we will have these different categories and we work, will work on them as a team once the contract is awarded? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I say yes, but <laughs> there's always those caveats. In some instances, uh, there have been pre-existing strained relationships and the parties say, you know what, you know, by analogy, I hate to use this analogy, but I must, you know, hey, we're going to get divorced. Uh, but before we go and get divorced, let's go and get some marriage counseling. Uh, so the marriage counseling means, hey, we're going to take on a relational enterprise charter. And let's try that before we formally divorce each other. And so in some instances, the contract became strained. They embraced relational approaches, used a relational charter, and somewhat retroactively integrated it in. So that has been a, you know, a data point. But in most instances, the customer goes out to the supply base and says, we want to bring you in for support, uh, for contract support, for services, maintenance, whatever, repairs. Uh, we want to follow a relational approach. Here's what we see as some of the core tenets around relational contracting. Here's the nine, these nine bullet points you see on the screen. You know, are you going to endorse, embrace these approaches? And of course, every contractor is going to say yes to that. I mean, can you imagine one saying no? But then in the RFP, the question goes a little further and says, okay, if you are going to support this, give us examples of how you have, you know, pushed on these points in other relationships, on other accounts in your portfolio, or here's a fact pattern with some problems in it, how would you approach this hypothetical? And so people are using it as a, yes, a filter, a pre-selection of a contractor, but in many instances, they're bringing relational and enterprise mentality into a, an existing strained relationship. This isn't to say that you get rid of the 150-page boilerplate contract language. No, that still sits there. It still gets done. But this becomes the relational enterprise becomes more of a scope of work, statement of work type of service level agreement type of document that you feather in with the rest of that, you know, typically at times onerous, one-sided traditional contract language, and you use that one-sided language as somewhat of, a, oh, a threat saying, hey, if we can't collaborate, then we're going to revert back to, to the traditional approach. Uh, not saying that's a good message to send. <laughs> yes, you're either going to collaborate with us or we'll beat you over the head. But, you know, that is the uh, direction some of those have gone. So hopefully that, Maureen, does that answer your yes, question? Yes, um, because this is um, really rather a new concept for many of us who are federal, are there examples of successful um, documents that cover these areas? You, when you say documents, contract documents or articles? Uh, I mean, like, you know, uh, oh, I'm gonna newspaper guess, stories? Uh, I mean, I'm going to guess what they were asking is for uh, examples. It wouldn't. I guess it wouldn't be in the contract. It would be something that's created after the contract. Um, so, anything right. that was fleshed out, I, I'm going to guess is what they're looking for. Yeah, I, I can send you a white paper that I've co-authored. Uh, there's a, and plus we're writing a book on it as well, uh, drawing in examples, success stories from around the globe. 
Uh, in fact, uh, Oliver Hart, who just recently, you know, about three years ago, won a Nobel Prize on contracting and you know, sort of ambiguities in contracts, has been advocating this approach for a number of years, and he's going to write the preface to the book that myself and three colleagues are putting together. Uh, so, and in that, in books like that, we're bringing tons of examples in. But this is stuff that we see in the oil and gas sector. We're seeing in public sector. Uh, I use the example of the, you know, patrol boat because it is clearly a public sector instance, and it's currently happening right now with the Australians, and the Canadians are replicating it. But yeah, there's t there's a lot of other examples that could be brought in. Let, let, me, let me give you a, a real quick example. I, I've always found this to be just fascinating. Uh, it's helping out an oil and gas client uh, in the retail side, meaning, meaning gasoline stations. And uh, the head of the customer organization engineering group end users, guy's name is Rolf Rusin. So Rolf you know, is in the kickoff meeting with the supplier now that they've got a strategic partnership with the supplier, and during the first meeting, Rolf looks at the head of sales and says, hey, Steve, now what is it about us as a customer that just drives you crazy? What could we do to change things up in order to make your lives easier and hopefully drive down costs? Well, Steve looked at his colleagues in the room that day, and he somewhat you know, hesitantly blurted out, well, Rolf, it goes to the red stripe. And Rolf's like, what do you mean? Well, they were buying, they call them gasoline dispensers. It's gas pumps to you and me. I mean, we call them gas pumps. Uh, the, this customer, their gas pumps had this little red stripe around the shroud of the outside of the gasoline dispensers. And these gas pumps cost $10,000 each. And the, the customer is buying thousands of them every year. So this represents like $10 million of expenditures. And uh, uh, Steve says, Rolf, if you stop with that red stripe, we can, it basically amounts to 20% of the cost of the dispenser. Basically meaning instead of $10,000, the price would go down to 8,000. And Rolf says, well, to his colleagues, why is it that we have this red stripe? And the colleagues shrugged their shoulders and said, I don't know, Rolf, <laughs> that's just the way it's always been. Well, a week later, Rolf and Steve and their teams come back into the room and Rolf says, you know what, we've done some research. Steve, you're absolutely right. The red stripe doesn't make any sense. We don't know why it's there. Uh, so we've elected to discontinue having that red stripe. And uh, now let's figure out what the price is going to be on these gasoline dispensers. And Steve goes, well, frankly, Ralph, we don't really are not up for sharing in any of the savings. And Ralph's like, what do you mean? You're going to still charge us $10,000 for these pumps? And Steve goes, no, actually, we're only going to charge you 8000 We don't want any of the savings. And Ralph's like, well, you came up with this great idea. We want you to share in some. How about if you charge us $9,000? we will split the difference. And Steve's like, no, Ralph, we'll charge you eight. And Ralph's like, no, charge us 9000 I mean, it was one of the craziest conversations I've ever been in the room to hear where the customer is pleading with the supplier, please charge us more. And the supplier says, no, we're not. We insist on charging you less. And that you know, type of oh, red stripe discussion is what's happening in relational contracting, where people have common objectives of driving down the cost of a gasoline pump or doing maintenance on naval vessels cheaper, quicker, easier. And so building somewhat of a culture, building somewhat oh, measures and metrics, that's what's really important. And it doesn't I, as an attorney, I hate to say it, but it doesn't matter what the contract says. What matters is what's the culture and the behaviors that are working on that oh, relationship. Yes, the contract's there as guidance. It's somewhat the operations manual, if you will. But the operations manual to date in so many of our relationships has been greatly broken. And we see as we interview, as we get involved with clients around the globe, as we have discussions with them, there you are know, so many instances where people have said they've gotten away from the traditional beat up your supplier, squeeze every penny out of them, and let's find ways to making it mutually beneficial for both parties. And that's something you're not going to get into you know, a contract. You're not going to 
build trust through a contract. You know, I always joke with people, you know, I, I just don't know how to write a contract clause where I say, I hereby warrant and represent that I'm going to trust you. You know, it, you just can't build the trust and collaboration, innovation, force it into these relationships. It's something that's going to happen through the relationship rather than the contract document. You know, I'm, I won't mention them by name, but there's a large Detroit-based automobile manufacturer who sent out a memo to all of its uh, suppliers saying, we, one of the major automobile manufacturers, insist that you come up with innovative ideas and we, if you're going to stay as our supplier, you've got to come up with a quarterly basis, a uh, suggestion in the suggestion box for innovation. And, you know, so suppliers start turning in innovation su suggestions every quarter, and a number of them were getting disappointed because that same automobile manufacturer would take these great ideas and say, wow, what a wonderful idea. And then they take that great idea out to market and say to their entire supply base, please quote, give us a bid on how you can do this for as cheap as possible. So the supplier who's coming up with the great innovative idea basically is having their idea shared with all their competitors and being undercut by people who can do it cheaper than they would uh, be willing to do. So, you know, that's not collaboration. That's not working together. That's just sort of stealing ideas from your suppliers and many times the suppliers will play along once or twice but eventually they're going to get tired and impatient and they're going to somewhat uh, distance themselves. So the contract, you can force the contractor to provide innovative ideas on a quarterly basis. You can build it into the contract but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. You've got to have behaviors and culture uh, relationships are the platform in which that happens rather than the contract document. Okay. Maureen, does that help? Or yeah, does thank it only you very generate much. more questions? No, it was a really good okay. example. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I just sort of put a challenge out to the people listening in today. You know, how many red stripes could you come up with? with you and your contractor in the room, you know, and almost say, hey, once a quarter, I need to come up with a red stripe idea, and it can't be forced upon them. It has to be somewhat, you know, encouraged. But the first time you try it, the supplier most likely is going to be a little hesitant, is going to sit there and say, you know, do I really trust, you know, the customer that they don't have some ulterior dastardly motive here? You know, you've got to you know, somewhat win over their confidence because once you open that door, it becomes a floodgate of innovative ideas. But if the first, you know, water out of the dam is, you know, somewhat with a dye in it, then it's going to really somewhat taint the pool that you're filling with that. So um, enough said, enough analogies and, you know, uh, also. Uh, let me uh, move us on along here. So reputation management, uh, this somewhat goes hand in hand with the whole enterprise and relational collaborative contracting approach. Um, we're seeing across the globe uh, with the advent and proliferation of social media and various other similar oh, developments in life that word spreads really quick. You know, all of a sudden a contractor tweets out a problem and thousands of people hear about it everywhere. And so is this something that you face within the U.S. federal government where if there is a problem, does it get somewhat oh, put out in the press? I mean, the transparency challenges that you face within the U.S. federal government, much like any other government, be it Australia, Canada, UAE, South Africa, uh, Nigeria, and so forth, you know, the press is going to always be looking for examples. And they've got a lot of helpers now due to social media, you know, helping find instances where somebody's not quite happy. And so if you somewhat treat your reputation as an asset, an asset that you want to nurture and develop, that you want to protect and make sure is as high as possible, 
you know, taking that reputation in somewhat of a different view and finding ways in which you can create greater benefit from that rather than a negative or poor reputation in which you're going to incur certain costs uh, and liabilities because of it. It's a very fragile thing indeed. It's, you know, you've got to remediate your reputation each time you break it or damage it. And that takes a lot of time and effort. But in the instances where your reputation is great, it's amazing at how much benefit and value your suppliers will come and work with you. Uh, there, going back to the automobile industry, there's a guy out of Oakland University, which is just outside of Detroit, and his name is John Henke. Uh, he runs, he's a professor at, university, at Oakland University, but he also runs a consultancy on the side called Planning Perspectives. And John Henke uh, has been doing a study for a number of years in the auto industry. He does it every year. He gets commissioned by the major automobile manufacturers, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford. And they all pony up some money for him to go and do this study because he does interviews, he does surveys, he does a lot of research, he brings in graduate students to help and all, but they still have plane tickets to buy to fly to Japan and around the world. Well, thousands of suppliers to the auto industry participate in this study. And John basically asks a core question to all of those suppliers, and that is on a scale of 100 being we love them, down to zero being we hate them, we wouldn't give them the time of day if we had, if we had the choice, you know, how much do you value your relationship with this automobile manufacturer? And John looked at multiple facets. It's not just a single question like that. And um, he charts the responses. Year after year, the people who come in at 99% or an answer, a score of 99 are Honda and Toyota. The people who come in at the bottom of the scale are General Motors and Ford. They get like a 20 or 30 rating. Chrysler is up around 40 and Nissan's are around 60. Well, every year the results come back and you know somewhat consistent with the way I just laid out. Well, after a few years, General Motors said to John, you know what, John, we're not going to participate in the study anymore. And he's like all shocked, why not? And General Motors said, well, basically, uh, every year we're in last place. Why would we sponsor the study yet another year only to find out we're in last place again? We know we're in last place, so why do we have to pay to find that out? And John reacted with a question of, well, I've been giving you a report every time I do the study each year. What are you doing with the results of the report, the recommendations? And General Motors, the response is, well, you know, we glance at the report, you know, we tell a few people, a couple of old college interns to come up with some ideas, but it never really goes too far. And yet the Honda and the Toyota folks, when they get that report, they study it with meticulous focus and they're just absolutely uh, obsessed with it. So that, you know, type of oh, difference in attitude uh, is going to, you know, somewhat go towards your reputation. Do you see reputation as being important? Honda and Toyota do, but does General Motors and Ford, do they have that same focus around reputation as being an asset? And are they going to manage it the same? So we want to make sure that our reputation is at the highest level it can be with our suppliers, with our commercial partners, and we want to make sure that we prevent the dings to our reputation because it's so much more, just like quality and TQM, it's so much easier to prevent a problem than it is to have to go out and correct and react to that problem. So with that all said, I shared with you six practices that six uh, the list of six practices is not complete. The question I have for you, not to answer right now today in this session, but you know, what other best practices do you have? Have you identified? Not necessarily on the list of six that I gave you, but you know, what seventh or eighth best practices out there? And if you shrug your shoulders and say, mm, I, I don't know, we don't really have any, then I encourage you to start giving some thought 
start doing some research, start doing some benchmarking. And frankly, I wouldn't always encourage you to benchmark against other government organizations. Benchmark against the private sector. I had a, a call the other, oh, maybe now about four or five months ago from somebody in Amtrak, uh, and they wanted to benchmark how contracting is done in the private sector. And so the head of auditing and con in, uh, for contract management at Amtrak wanted to reach out to uh, General Motors, to Hewlett Packard, to uh, Dell, to Apple, to, and there were five or six other companies you know, across multiple industries. John Deere, I think, was on the list. And so I made those introductions for them to do that benchmark discussions. And the questions were the same from Amtrak, you know, with each of those conversations. And it was, I think British Petroleum was in there, or Shell, uh, Chevron. Uh, but basically, it didn't matter if they were in the aerospace industry or the automotive industry, the oil and gas industry, technology sector. They all had practices that the uh, audience on the other side of the call at Amtrak we're taking notes around and saying, wow, that's really interesting. That's something that we could definitely latch on to. So I, I've been in those conversations with Amtrak and the private sector. I encourage you, it doesn't matter if you're sitting in defense or agriculture, health and human services, veteran affairs, transportation, energy, there are players out there. And if you want to speak with governments, you know, such as Australians or the British government. The UK government actually is doing some really cool stuff. They've gotten rid of procurement. They don't call it procurement anymore. They call it commercial services. And the British, you know, it's the Crown, so they call it Crown Commercial Services. And they, within Crown Commercial Services, have as one of their objectives is to look at how to drop their 9.15% value leakage number down to significantly lower percentages. Now, I'm paraphrasing that. That's not literally what they say. But that's one of the core purposes of Crown Commercial Services of the UK government is how can we identify our value loss and how can we go after those holes that are creating that value loss? And how have others done it in the private sector and public sector? And so they, within Crown Commercial Services, have started to make some really good progress in that direction. So you know, are these uh, supply chain practices that I've mentioned to you here today, are they the norm or are they an exception? Are this, is this new territory for you or is this you know, somewhat old hat? I would assume category management is somewhat old hat. So some of the points that I raised, Many of you have already said, yep, been there and we're already on that path. But other things is viewing the enterprise as a collaboration between you and your suppliers, you know, building trust, uh, building reputation, building collaboration and innovation with your suppliers. That might be something relatively new. But in order to get moving in that direction, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to ask yourself, what skills do I need? or does my team need to have in order to get moving in that direction? And I share with you here on, the, on this slide something that came out of the World Economic Forum about three or four years ago. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's 2019, how time flies. So out in 2015, the World Economic Forum was forecasting what are the skills, the top 10 skills needed in 2020 when it comes to, oh, com commercial management, if you will. And the list on the right-hand side of the slide from 2015 has a lot of repeat, oh, presence on the list on the left-hand side for 2020. For instance, complex problem solving, top of the list. But look at some of the new entrants, such as emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility. You know, they weren't even on the top 10 list in 2015. Some things on the list in 2015, like creativity, number 10 on the list, it's gone up to number three, or they forecast it to go up to number three in 2020. Uh, critical thinking went up a few notches, but some things, oh, such as 
uh, quality control somewhat fell off the list. Why? Well, because the skills aren't as important because automation is coming in and the automation is going to help more and more with quality control. You'll notice that our good friend negotiation that everyone always loves to focus on as a skill is fallen from number five to number nine. There too, some of it is due to technology, reverse auctions, various other automated platforms is taking away some of our role as negotiators and letting the computers do it. So I would encourage you to look at the list of 2020 and ask yourself, do I have strength in each of these 10 areas of skills or are there gaps that I need to close and work upon? Because we need to, as a oh, discipline, if you will, we need to avoid the pitfalls, we need to be viewed by our internal stakeholders as basically the business enablement team. And unfortunately, we, many of us, are being viewed as the business disablement team. And you don't want to have your stakeholders or, you know, shaking their head, closing their eyes, and holding their head down saying, oh my gosh, I've got to go with, meet with so-and-so and I know it's just going to be a painful meeting, and what I want to try to accomplish commercially here within the federal government with my suppliers, it just isn't going to happen because I've got to go through this barrier over this hurdle known as you know, uh, the commercial, the supply management team. And so we want to make sure that the disablers, the behaviors, the traits are not present within our organization. We want to make sure that we don't have myopia. We want to make sure, and when I say myopia, that being short-sighted, just looking short-term tactically, you know, what is the broader strategy? What's the vision for our organization, but also for the enterprise? What am I doing to make sure that the relationships with, between us and the customer, the government organization, and externally with the supplier are working together as an enterprise? What's the strategy? What are those objectives, the key metrics that we're working towards, those deliverables we're trying to deliver? And what am I doing to long-term make that happen? You know, are we flexible? Or are we sitting there as statues, you know, sort of granite statues, inflexible and just not willing to budge and not to move? Increasingly, in this world of VUCA, of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. We're finding the VUCA environment that many of us are facing. We've got to build our agility and our flexibility abilities in order to provide value. Any instances where we've run the research around where that value leakage of 9.15% sits, it's because Failure to be agile and flexible. We're trying to do a one-size-fits-all. Here's our purchase order that we within the federal government use. This purchase order worked on these 20 projects. Therefore, it's going to work on the 21st project. Even though on the 21st project, there are attributes and parameters that are totally new and different than on the 20 previous projects. Having that mentality that this has worked in the past. It's worked on a lot of other stuff. Therefore, it will work on this next one. That approach has to be somewhat moderated and held in check. I would encourage you to look and see, are you being agile? Are you being flexible in how you're supporting your internal clients as well as your suppliers? Are we being too much of a renegade? You know, yes, we need to be flexible and agile, but too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And so we don't want to get to the point where we're so flexible and agile that we're viewed as a loose cannon, somewhat of a renegade. We have to make sure that governance and compliance are in place and that the, we follow and adhere to those parameters of governance and compliance in our contracting, in our commercial management approaches. And we can't be sitting in you know, a, a silo, being isolationist. We have to make sure that, you know, we are 
collaborating, we're working as a team. That collaboration and teamwork is the way for contract management. It's not just a unique anomaly that on occasion occurs by chance. It is almost like we have to deliberately define that collaboration is going to be the way. And going back to the segmentation point, we're not going to find ways of collaborating on the bottom left quadrant, the low end, uh, low value transaction where it's a $10,000, $20,000 item. You know, on the big multi-million dollar relationships and projects, collaboration has got to be the way for us to be able to generate much greater commercial value. We can't be thorns. We cannot, you know, be that, you know, nightmare that people are oh, trying to avoid. We have to make sure that people are coming to us being the customer of choice. You know, what is your reputation? Are you, you know, a, supply, a customer that suppliers are always out trying to uh, avoid? Well, it's, you know, it's the U.S. federal government. Uh, we have to deal with them. We do want to have that government business, so we'll just tolerate them. Or is it, wow, they're a huge customer, but they're also so easy to work with. We love working with these folks within the U.S. government. And in many instances that, you know, wanting to work with each other comes at a personal level. You build those personal relationships with, you know, somebody across the table from you. But in terms of the larger structure of that entity, dealing with the U.S. federal government, is it something that many of your suppliers say, oh, my gosh, we just don't want to have to deal with these people with these processes, with these regulations, with these you know structural parameters, it just makes life way too difficult and inefficient for us. You know, are we somewhat latched on to the past? Are we antiques, or are we embracing new developments such as automation, new tools out there? And those tools are yielding superior results for those who have embraced it. But do we sit there and say, you know what, that automation, that's great, but yeah, it won't work here uh, for these 25 excuses and reasons. But try to find ways of knocking down some of those reasons, those barriers, and coming forward with new approaches. And what are our skills and competencies? Are we viewed as lagging rather than leading uh, in the oh, skill set area? So. The final few slides I'm going to run through with you are, are really, you know, things around how to, questions to ask yourself on how to avoid some of these pitfalls. I don't really have answers for you in today's session for these questions, but I'd really like these next few slides to serve as somewhat of a checklist, somewhat of a, you know, stimulate some thought for you as you look at these areas. So in terms of aligning your contracts, uh, to the broader strategies of the organization or of that enterprise, you know, first off, what is the strategy? Do I even know what it is? You know, what is the enterprise? Who's in it? Who? How many parties are in that enterprise? Is it me and my uh, supplier, contractor, or are we extending it to the sub-suppliers? In some instances, we see enterprises as being defined as the customer and a group of four or five of competing contractors who are working together. A guy named Ron Harmon works for a client that I've had for a number of years. Uh, he was buying engineered equipment, uh, and part of the engineered equipment, an item is known as a heat exchanger. Well, Ron buys thousands of heat exchangers, and there's not one supplier, one fabricator who can provide all of it. So Ron needs to have three or four fabricators to create heat exchangers for Ron and his category expenditures. And so Ron basically brings those four or five contractors together in a joint conversation and says, hey, I'm the customer, the four or five of you are competitors, yes, but you and the aggregate are providing me with all the heat exchangers that I am going to need for this coming year. And I want you to work together to figure out where your peaks and valleys are in terms of your workload. And as supplier A, if you are at 100% capacity, 
you need to let customer uh, supplier B or C know that these projects are ones that they should be picking up or if you're in a trough in terms of your workflow you need to be notifying the other suppliers and working together so that you as a somewhat coordinated group of contractors in deploying your services are going to be a more effective solution for me, the customer. You know, they're not to be discussing pricing or terms and conditions, various other contractual. All they're talking about is their ability to perform and deliver fabricate heat exchangers. And so do you want to define your enterprise as a cluster of contractors working together or a contractor and subcontractor and sub-subcontractor or is it really just you and that one single uh, contractor or supplier? Ask yourself, what tactics can I use in order to assist with that alignment across the enterprise? You know, what is the broader value that's going to come from that alignment? And can I, and somehow my contracts, enable flexibility and agility you know, to be you know, somewhat responsive to the changes in the needs that are arising? Which team members do I want to bring in from within my stakeholder community, my extended team, as well as my core table team? Who needs to be involved and included? And in some instances, who do we need to somewhat deliberately keep out of this? And we don't want to come across as exclusionary, but sometimes there are individuals who are really taking it upon themselves to sabotage an organization or a relationship. Hopefully that will be few and far between for you. But on one of those relational projects that we had in Australia, a uh, guy, his name is Brett. Uh, Brett showed up for the kickoff meeting and after we spent oh, an hour or two talking about how we're gonna collaborate, we're gonna come up with innovation, Brett raised his hand and somewhat in, that, in a grumpy voice curmudgeonly said, well, are we just going to sit here all day having warm and fuzzy discussion? Or are we actually going to capture something here? You know, you could tell right away that Brett just wasn't on board. But over a period of around six months of seeing the relationship build and develop, Brett turned into one of the strongest supporters of that initiative rather than one of the strongest detractors. So some team members you might want to Keep a minimal involvement and ramp them up as you get their thoughts, their attitude and outlook changed. Uh, some are going to be eager participants from day one. And you've just got to make sure that you're balancing that team roster uh, with the phase in which you're at, uh, whether the contractors are going to be involved at each and every stage or not. Uh, flexibility, agility, you know, why? Are they an issue within our organization? I've already addressed the issue around VUCA, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. We've got to ask ourselves, you know, is too much agility and flexibility going to ruin it? Will it become more chaotic than uh, beneficial? Uh, what can we do to anticipate the commercial parameters, you know, two to ten years in advance? You know, <laughs> PPP, public-private partnerships, are really challenging because in most instances, those contracts for privatization and you know, PPP type arrangements are 30, 35 year contracts. Well, the people who are putting that contract together today are gonna basically either be retired or late in their career and hopefully moved on to other projects within the subsequent 35 years. And so, the people who put the deal together aren't in any way going to be around when the deal is midterm or even at its end. So we have to make sure that we think far enough down the road and plan for that, make sure that we're flexible and agile, but know that regardless if we're flexible or not, things are going to change in a matter of a few years, and we just have to build systems uh, contract mechanisms, uh, measures, uh, skills that allow us that inevitable need for flexibility. Uh, because without the flexibility, our contract is going to become irrelevant 
I can't tell you the number of instances on a current transaction where I've asked to, you know, do a glance through of the contract document, and when it gets pulled out of a, you know, literally out of a Manila file folder, it's a piece of paper, it's so antiquated, it hasn't even been digitally captured yet, and the paper is yellowed and, you know, somewhat brittle. You read through, and <laughs> many instances, the names of the companies have changed. You know, obviously the you know the notices section is totally irrelevant, uh, but the core scope of what's being bought has changed significantly. You know, do you have a contract with IBM for typewriter repair services? You know, back when they were a typewriter company, or has your contract changed with the changing scope and direction? Uh, so, is there a manual um, or an automated effort in place for ourselves within our organization? When we get to governance and compliance, we want to make sure that governance and compliance are treated with the reverence and the importance that they deserve. You know, there are always going to be best practices in anything, and governance and compliance is no exception. And what are the tools and tactics? that leading organizations are using? What are the best practices that they've put in place around governance and compliance? And is there any potential value in the contract you know, that isn't being fully captured? What is the leakage rate that you have in your contracts? And the reputation uh, is going to be one for uh, improvement, or is it, hey, governance and compliance is already helping our reputation be maintained at the highest level out there. Uh, it is a team effort, and I have to ask you, what skills are you developing in your teams around governance and compliance? And so with that all said, we have to then look at collaboration. Uh, collaboration, is it part of your culture? In many instances, it's not. And so your challenge, the hill you're going to have to climb around creating collaborative contracting and commercial solutions is going to be steeper. And you have to identify some instances where that is worth pursuing. You know, will our commercial partner be ready to collaborate? I, some oh, automobile manufacturers or some retail uh, chains out there, some other Players in various uh, sectors are notorious for being really large and inflexible, and some are being viewed as easy to do business with. You know, frankly, and I just raise this as just more in jest than anything else, but I'm halfway serious in raising it. I would love to be able to see a survey that gets run across the various functions of the U.S. federal government, the various departments and agencies where suppliers who deal across all of them come in with a rating system and say, well, this department, you know, they're just so easy to work with, and this agency, uh, they're halfway there, and boy, this agency or department, they're an absolute nightmare. Is there repeated, consistent feedback from across supplier community who says, agency or department A, these are the best people to work with, the best agency, and Agency Z, they're just a nightmare. Uh, do you have that insight and that knowledge? You know, are you viewed as somebody who is easy to collaborate with? Um, so enough said on that. Uh, you, is the collaboration linked to a person, or is it cutting across the group? And I'm going to get to this a little further here in the next five minutes. I want to, as we wrap up here, I'm going to give you some insights on the survey that I've been running for you where we had a couple dozen people respond. I just want to give you the highlights on that study. Uh, but also, how can the contract enable collaboration? Is the contract still very contentious and risk allocative, or is it set and toned in a different way? Okay. Uh, obviously, these questions are uh, questions that you'll have. You'll have access to these slides. But I just want to, I'm going to build that slide out real quick there. Whoops, build it out real quick. Just basically being that commercial partner of choice, I've touched on these points in this session, and these are just some of those questions that uh, I just want to make sure you have a physical, visible uh, copy of, okay?
skills and competencies as well. So in terms of some key takeaways from today's session, I want to make sure that uh, I take you into the survey results uh, briefly, uh, but, you know, once I share with the, and, and let me sort of sidetrack for just a moment. With the survey results, uh, the survey is still open. Uh, we're collecting information, responses from people. I encourage you, if you haven't completed the survey, to do so. It's only about a five-minute exercise for you. There's about, oh, maybe a dozen or so questions, and, some, and part of those questions are demographics of which branch of the gov government are you in. But the questions that we raise around innovation, collaboration, and being um, you know, somewhat looking at, you know, more challenging or not, you know, are questions that I think, you know, many people would be interested in getting the results around. So once I close off that survey here in another day or two, I am going to create a written report. Uh, and I'll send it off to Maureen and she can then circulate it internally to the rest of you. I mean, it's just part of participating in this session today. We just wanted to make sure that we collected the collective uh, thoughts of the audience. So in terms of some of the key things, at the end of today, you know, let me just build out this slide. At the, at the end of today, what I'd really like you to do is look at this list of seven items and ask yourself, how can I do at least one of these seven things? How can I create you know, in, integrative contract management strategies that include more than just myself or my immediate stakeholder? How can I create somewhat of an enterprise view? Uh, and if that question or that task isn't appealing to you, then, you know, perhaps the second one around looking for opportunities to improve your overall contract management approaches. How can you benchmark? Who should you benchmark with? What types of questions would you want to ask? What would you want to accomplish through that benchmarking? Uh, third point, identifying some new areas for value for money within your contract management program. Uh, most of you have responded in the survey that the most advanced area that you have between uh, category management, supplier relationship management, strategic sourcing, contract management and administration, it's that one, contract and management and administration, which is where you feel you are the most advanced. Well, if you're the most established in the contract management space, then you certainly should already be capturing a fair amount of value for money. But you've got at least, typically, at least another 9.15% value capture that you can somewhat go after. So I, I encourage you to give some thought to that. The fourth item, I mean the fifth item, uh, fourth, I'm sorry, fourth, risk management. How can you take on more of that prevention, mitigation, mentality, and approach rather than the allocative or distributive approach? Rather than forcing risk on the other party, why don't you look at that risk and say, how can we work together to make sure this risk never materializes? You know, in terms of a warranty or an indemnity, uh, some type of remedy, liquidated damages. Let's, let's make it where that event that, you know, somewhat results in that indemnity or warranty claim and arising, that that event never occurs. What can we do? A uh, great example is safety. Can we say to our suppliers in the case of an injury, you're going to bear the cost of that injury and, you know, if there's any lawsuits or any, you know, workers' comp claims, whatever, you, the contractor, are going to put that on your books. Okay, fine. But what if we work together between the customer and the contractor to prevent that injury from ever happening? Let's make sure that none of our employees ever get injured or have a fatal accident. If we don't have any injuries, if we don't have any fatalities, then we don't have to worry about the cost of that safety uh, basically being violated. So prevention rather than the mitigation, uh, rather than the allocation is important. We want to make sure that we transform contract management discipline, uh, hone your skills. And another thing too, and this is a trend that we're starting to see, contract management as a service. 
in this day and age of outsourcing going on for the past oh, 20 plus years, so much has been outsourced. And we're seeing development of what's known as uh, goods as a service, as well as various items, offerings as being offered as a service. And so contract management as a service is being viewed increasingly as an outsourceable uh, support area that rather than it being done within the U.S. federal government, we're going to outsource it to somebody somewhere outside in the private sector to do it for us instead because they can do it better, they can do it cheaper, they can do it quicker than we can. And if that is viewed as somewhat of a threat to you and how you're doing things, then I have to ask you, what can you do to prevent that ever being a, a viable business case? That if senior levels within the federal government said, hey, we should outsource contract management or uh, category management, supplier relationship management to a third party, gee, we're not going to do it because the people who are currently doing it are doing it so well and with such value generation that there is nobody in the private sector outside of the U.S. federal government who would be able to do it better with greater effect than the people who are doing it now, the incumbents. So I encourage you to somewhat uh, prevent the productization of the services that you're doing into a way in which it would be viewed to be cheaper and better if it got automated or outsourced. And as automation continues to come into the equation, the areas in which people are less threatened is in strategy development, sourcing strategies, category strategies, as well as the back end on supplier relationship management. The stuff in between in your process of going out and tendering negotiating, getting contracts drafted, tender packages produced, uh, brought to closure. Those tactics, those activities are increasingly being viewed as automatable. The front end of strategy development and the back end of relationship management are the areas that are less threatened. And so I have to ask you, you know, that stuff in the middle in the process, are you uh, best suited to be the provider of those services versus automation or somebody else. Um, so those are key objectives. Uh, let me just very briefly cover verbally some of the uh, results so far off of the survey, which I find quite interesting. Uh, there's a question in there that says, is the public uh, sector contracting sourcing practice more challenging or less challenging than the private sector? 58% uh, so far are saying yes, it is much more uh, challenging. Meaning that 42% are saying no, it's not much more challenging than what's going on in the private sector. I don't know if that surprises you, but that's what the numbers so far are bringing off of that survey. Uh, when asked, what is your most established area out of four or five being category management, strategic sourcing, uh, supplier relationship management, contract management, 63% are saying contract management, contract administration is the most established area within, you know, your domain. Uh, and when asked, what's the least established area, 37% are saying SRM. So that's the number one response so far. I find it interesting that 16% are saying that contract management is the least established. So that 16% plus the 63% who's saying contract management is the most established is covering basically what uh, around 80% uh, are saying it's either the most or the least. Um, so I find that intriguing. Uh, automation has enabled value generation 85% of the responses so far are saying that automation has enabled value generation. And with that said, going back to the prior point around contract management as a service, you're seeing automation getting inroads into you know, a number of activities within your discipline and those uh, 
those inroads are being recognized. 85% are saying automation has enabled value generation. Uh, in terms of how are your internal relationships with your stakeholders, um, excellent is an option that people can select. And so far, 0% has identified uh, the relations with internal stakeholders as being excellent. Uh, so the other 100% are saying it's less than excellent. Not even 1% saying it's excellent yet. Um, collaboration uh, as well as innovation are being perceived as really much more of a personal initiative. It's not being systemically, formally uh, perpetuated as an organizational approach. Uh, when innovation collaboration occur, it is on somewhat of a oh, personal initiative basis. So that is a quick summary of some of the results.